Welcome to the Quick Start Guide to Photoshop, part one. Hey guys, and welcome to Flurn. My name is Aaron Nace, and you can find me on flurn.com where we make learning Photoshop and photography fun. And I wanna welcome you guys to this Quick Start Guide to Photoshop. Basically what we did is we decided all right, if we're gonna look at Photoshop from a person who's just kind of getting to know the program, what are the essentials things that they, they should know when they're getting in to Photoshop? So if you guys are advanced users, things like that, this is probably gonna be all well below you. But if you're just getting into Photoshop, this is gonna be perfect guide for you. So in part one, this episode, we're gonna be going over everything you're gonna be doing kind of like before you start using Photoshop. Now part two, we're gonna get into the meat of it and show you some of the more commonly used tools in Photoshop and editing techniques and things like that. And then in part three, we're gonna come back and I'm gonna show you guys some of the things you're gonna do after your editing is done, like saving, exporting, and naming, things like that. So that's basically the intro. Let's go ahead and get into part one. So you guys just opened Photoshop, you're looking at something like this and uh, saying, now what do I do? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and open an image. You can do, go to file and then down to open. And you'll notice right beside every sing, pretty much every single prompt in Photoshop, you're gonna see a keyboard shortcut. This for open is gonna be command O. Now the first tip I'm gonna give you guys is that if you wanna get fast at Photoshop, the keyboard shortcuts are really the way to go. They allow me to work very, very fast because I'm not really going up to my menus and things like that going down and clicking on things. Most of the time I'm just hitting keyboard shortcuts. So if speed is a priority for you in Photoshop, get to know your keyboard shortcuts. So let's go ahead and hit Command O to open a new image. There we go. So you guys can have something nice and pretty to look at. And uh, we're gonna talk about a couple things here. So we just talked about the keyboard shortcuts. Let's go ahead and jump right into those because they are such an important part of Photoshop. So you'll be able to see, if you go to image and then mode, you can see maybe there aren't some keyboard shortcuts set up for these, but auto tone, there is a keyboard shortcut. So the really cool thing about Photoshop is that it actually allows you to go in and make your own and change the keyboard shortcuts that come with the program. To do so, go to your edit menu and then down here to keyboard shortcuts. So edit and then down to keyboard shortcuts. Now here you can see within the keyboard shortcuts, basically you have access to all the file menus. So if I wanna hit file, and then I have open. We just saw that was up here, right? File open is command O. Now if I wanted to change that, all I would have to do is click here and then hold down a keyboard shortcut. So really great. Basically the keyboard shortcuts, if there's something you're doing over and over again in Photoshop, chances are making a keyboard shortcut is going to make your life a lot more simple. I'll give you an example of one that I've created. So when I'm using Photoshop, I use Gaussian blur pretty much every time I'm editing an image, but there's no keyboard shortcut for it set up naturally. So I set up my own. So we're gonna go to keyboard shortcuts and menus. I'm gonna go down to filter, and then we can see it's gonna look exactly like what we've got in our menu system. And then we've got our blur and then Gaussian blurs right here. So to create this keyboard shortcut, just click there. I hit shift, option, command, and hit G, and then accept, and we're good to go. So now we have a keyboard shortcut for Gaussian blur. It's as simple as that. So if on my background layer, I wanna hit shift, option, command, G, and give this a nice blur, check that out really quick, so I don't have to go to any of my menus. All right, so now that we know how to do a Gaussian blur and get through some of our keyboard shortcuts, let's go through some of the menus and uh, kind of get your preferences set up so you can actually use Photoshop like a power user. To get to your preferences, just go to Photoshop, down to preferences, and to general. Now, a lot of these I leave exactly how they are. I think they're good preferences, but some of these I do like to change. Things like animated zoom, I usually turn that off. Things like flick panning, basically if you like click and like slide your finger, just like you would on an iPad, your image will move around. These things take up computer resources and personally I don't really like them. So I make sure to uncheck this sort of thing. There's a lot of preferences in here. If there's you know items that you're like, ah, I wish Photoshop wouldn't do this, check your preferences first. All right, interface, I change the border of all of my um, standard screen, full screen, full screen with menus. I turn the border off with all those because I don't really like having a border around my image. I wanna know exactly what it looks like on black or gray or white. Now the next thing I change is open documents as tabs. Personally, I love tabs when it comes to like Google Chrome, things like that, but I don't like tabs in Photoshop. So I make sure to uncheck that and that's just, again, these are preferences. Okay, sync settings, don't do too much there. 
file handling, there's actually a lot you can do here. Um, save in background, I would definitely recommend having this checked because what this does is if you're working on an image, it's going to save it in the background. Photoshop does have a tendency to use a lot of computer resources, and then sometimes that means it's going to crash. So if you're working on something like it's right now saving every 10 minutes, you can change it to five or an hour. You won't lose a ton of information because it's going to be saving in the background. OK. Now, another thing you can do is change, let's go to our performance. You can change how much Photoshop, how much of the RAM Photoshop is going to actually use. You can set up your scratch disks here as well. I'm using the Macintosh hard drive because I don't have a better option set up. But if you did have an external, external like a RAID array or something like that, that's what you would want to use a scratch disk. This other thing that we're going to check out, and a lot of people who are kind of young to Photoshop are really going to like, is the history states. This is basically how many times you can undo. And when I was first getting to know Photoshop, I would hit undo a ton until I would reach my limit, and then I couldn't hit undo anymore. I didn't know about this. So if you want to increase your history states, you can do so. You can type in 500 right there, and you can have 500 undos instead of only 25. Now, keep in mind this is stored in on your computer. So the more undo or the more history states you have, the slower your computer is going to get. It might not be that noticeable, but keep that in mind. If you have that number way up and your computer starts to really crank to a halt, that might be why. All right, other things I pretty much leave exactly how they are, from cursors all the way to type and experimental features. That's all good. We don't need to know that. So we're going to hit OK and move on. The next big thing we should set up when we're first using Photoshop is our color settings. So to get to the color settings, I'm going to go to Edit and then down here to Color Settings. Now, there are a ton of questions floating around about, OK, which color settings should I use? What are better for you know, the different areas? And you know, what's better for print? What's better for web? What's better for editing? All right, I'm going to show you guys what I do. You can do the same thing if you want. And um, then it'll be really easy to follow along with my tutorials. So here on our RGB, this is RGB is just red, green, and blue. This is our, um, our color space. You're going to get, by default, I think it comes with sRGB, which is basically the smallest color space. This is a, not a whole lot of information is contained in the sRGB color space. Now, sRGB is really great when you go to upload your image to the internet because the internet reads sRGB color space natively. So editing-wise, you don't want to be in sRGB because you're working with a little bit of information. But when you get it out to the internet, you do want to use sRGB. So where does that come in? How do you actually navigate that? I'll tell you in a second. So Profoto RGB is the color space that I would recommend because it's the largest. We're working with the most amount of colors and the most amount of information with your image. So you can edit it more, and it's not going to look as bad the further you push and pull your pixels. So Profoto RGB is what I would check. So let's make sure that's checked there. And the other option here on the bottom, profile mismatches, missing profiles, ask when pacing. Those do not come checked by default, which means that if you try to bring an image in that has an sRGB color space, Photoshop's just going to be like, uh, I'll just do whatever I want with it. I don't know what it defaults to. But I prefer to ask if there's a mismatch color profile. So ask when opening, ask when opening, ask when opening. There we go. Let's hit OK. I'm going to close this. And we're going to open it again, and you'll see what that looks like. So I'm going to hit Command-O. We're just going to open this image again. And what we're going to say is this document has an embedded color profile that does not match the current. The embedded is sRGB, because I got this from the internet. My working is a Profoto RGB. So what I want to do is I want to convert the document's colors, the sRGB, from the internet to the working space that I'm actually working in, which is Profoto RGB. So I'm going to hit Convert. We're going to hit OK. So it converts them. Now, let's say that I edit this, and it's all awesome, and I want to get it back out to the internet. Well, there's a great way to do that. You go to File, and then we go to Save for Web. <laughs> Daisy likes that command, apparently. OK, Save for Web. Now, in the Save for Web, and we're going to get more into this in the third part. I just want to make sure we cover color so you're not super, you know, like, ah, OK, he told us to use Profoto, but now how do I get it back to sRGB when I want to upload it? Just go to Save for Web, and it'll automatically convert to sRGB when you're saving it. You can even change the width and things like that. So let's say we want a width of 500 pixels there. It, you can do it right here in your Save dialog. It's going to put it as a JPEG or a PNG or a GIF, and it's going to convert to sRGB when it saves it out. So you never have to worry about getting it to the internet in the correct color space.
The next big thing you guys will want to know when working in Photoshop are some of the tools that we use in Photoshop, namely this one. This is a Wacom Intuos Pro small tablet. It is a wireless tablet that uses one of these great pens here. And it basically allows you to paint on your screen. So as I move over here, it causes the cursor to move on my screen. It's also pressure sensitive. So the harder I press, I can do different things like make more ink come out of my brush or make my brush larger or smaller, depending on how hard I press. There are also buttons, just like mouse buttons that are programmable on this Wacom Intuos. Now we have two complete wonderful episodes on how to use one of these, where to pick one up and how to set them up and everything like that. We're gonna link to it on the screen now as well as down below in the description. So I would really recommend you guys pick up one of these Wacom tablets. They run anywhere from the lesser expensive versions, run usually right around $100. This one I think is right about $200. Uh, very worthwhile if you plan on using Photoshop. So once you have your preferences set up and your color settings, you're ready to actually go in Photoshop. Now, I'm gonna show you guys kind of like how the program is actually laid out so you're really familiar with where the tools are and menus and options and things like that. So over here on your left is your toolbar. Now, any of these things you can have disappear or reappear by going to Window. Let's say I go down to Tools, there it goes away. Window, down to Tools, and it comes back. We have things like the Marquee tool, which makes selections. Let's click on that and we're gonna make a selection. Now, if I wanted to make a selection and then grab my brush tool and then start painting, it would only paint in that selection. So we're not going super in depth here. Check out our Photoshop 101 Pro tutorial if you wanna go very in depth with every single tool and every feature that Photoshop has to offer. But for right now, this is where our tools are located. So we have things like the Move tool, we have the Selection tools. Now we have another grouping of tools that are actually going to do something to the image. So like the selection tool, for instance, it's not gonna actually do anything to the image, but the brush tool is going to actually allow you to edit your image. Same thing with the, the clone stamp tool, where it's gonna be, you can sample an area and then paint basically the same thing in a new area. Check out our episode two for the quick start guide to Photoshop for some of our commonly used tools. So each of these tools on the left here corresponds with a bunch of options that are at the top. So you can see if I go to my move tool, we've got options for our move tool. If I go to my magic wand tool, now we have sampling options, like I want a point sample or I want a 100 by 100 sample. I can change my tolerance, which changes, like if right now I click over here, I have a tolerance of 14, it's gonna select, yeah, some pixels. If I wanna select more pixels that are similar to the color that I click, I can click and drag and up my tolerance and now you can see we've selected a lot more. So each of these tools is gonna to come with its own unique set of options. We can change the mode of a brush, the opacity and flow and things like that. And this is where we get access to all of our tools. Now down here at the bottom, we have like the hand tool, which basically pans around the image. You can use spacebar instead of that. And we have the magnifying glass tool, which will allow you to zoom. Now, I don't use the magnifying glass and I don't use the hand tool because there are keyboard shortcuts set up for most of these things. So let's say I did want to zoom in or out of my image. There are a lot of ways to do it other than grabbing the magnifying glass. You can hold control or command and hit the minus key that's going to zoom out, or you can hit the plus key and that's going to zoom in. You can hold space bar and control or command and click anywhere on your image and drag to the left or the right and that's going to zoom in or out of that place that you're actually clicking on as well. Very, very cool. Or right here under your navigator, you can use the small mountains to zoom out or the big mountains to zoom in. So this is pretty indicative of how Photoshop actually works. Just about everything you're gonna be doing in Photoshop has a bunch of different methods for going about doing the same thing. Zooming has three or four different keyboard shortcuts that just allow you to zoom. So this is why Photoshop is so important to get into your keyboard shortcuts because they're very, very powerful. So now you know where the tools are and you're all excited and you wanna start using them and I'm gonna grab my brush tool and I'm gonna start signing my name. I'm gonna write Aaron so everyone knows who edited this image. And that's cool, except for it's stuck on my background layer. Now I'm like, okay, I wanna get rid of that. Maybe I can grab the eraser tool and I can erase that away. That's okay, except it starts to erase the background image as well. And to handle this problem, Photoshop introduced layers. So what layers do basically is allow you to put new things, either a change of color, or adding objects, things like that, uh, retouching, you know, if you're gonna be using a clone stamp or a healing brush tool, you can do these things on new layers so they don't affect your original image. So your layers are located right over here. So all these tools are done on layers. 
Let's go ahead and create a new layer by clicking on the new layer dialog. And I'm going to use my brush tool now. And we're going to do the same type of thing. I'm going to write my name, all beautiful. And now, if I wanted to hit the eraser tool, E for the eraser tool, I can start erasing it. And it's just going to erase my name. It's not going to erase the image underneath it. I could grab my move tool, and I can move this signature around. Or I could transform it. I could hit Command T, which would transform this. And I can shrink this down and put it wherever I want. I can rotate it. I can flip it sideways and upside down and things like that as well. So because it's on its own layer, it acts independently of everything else. And that's why layers are so important, because they allow you to work at a really nice pace in Photoshop where you don't have everything stuck jumbled together. So if you need to undo, or let's just say I wanted to get rid of this signature, I just hit the delete key. That layer goes away, and so does the signature that's tied to that layer. So layers. Now, there are other couple of cool things we're going to be doing, and we're going to get into these in section two. But if I do decide to paint something like this on top of my image, there we go. We also have blend modes that come along with layers. So here where it says normal, if I want to change this to something like overlay, you're going to see, let's grab our move tool, it's just going to kind of blend in with this image in a different way than just totally looking normal. We can change it to multiply, and it's going to make it really dark. So getting into Photoshop means play around with things like your blend modes. Like Throw some colors on here. Start painting around. Let's paint some pink on there and see what that does. Let's change our blending mode to a soft light and see what that does. The more you play around here and get familiar with what these blending modes do, the better you're going to be in Photoshop and say, like, OK, I need to be this a little bit brighter and a little more blue. Maybe I can paint light blue on top of it and then change it to an overlay or a screen blending mode, and it's going to do exactly what I want. So keep those in mind. You have all these layers, and they come with blending modes. So you can always change them back to normal. You can do things like change your opacity. They're very, very, very powerful. OK, now we have our layers. Channels are a little bit more advanced. We're not going to mess with that today. And then paths are a, basically a function of using our pen tool, which we're not going to get into today as well. But just to let you know that each one of these things, they do correspond with something else in the image. Now, we have another set of adjustments, and these are adjustment layers. So let's say we want to grab a brightness contrast adjustment layer. Well, this layer, I can adjust my brightness or contrast for the entire image, a lot like what we actually did if you guys are familiar with Lightroom. Let's say you know Lightroom we talked about is really great for global adjustments. Well, this is exactly what these are. We're making the image brighter, things like that. We can even, you know what, let's delete that one. And I want to create like a hue saturation. So you can go find hue saturation. They're located here. I also click on this little circle right down here. And they're in word form over here, which I prefer, actually. OK, so our hue saturation, let's just say we decide to change the hue a little bit on our image. Now, in Lightroom, that would be pretty much like, OK, cool. We changed the hue of our entire image. But I don't want this visible on everything. And that's where layer masks come in in Photoshop. So, I know we're getting more and more complex here, but we're almost done with the basic fundamentals of Photoshop. So our layer mask basically control what's visible on a layer. So right now, we have a white layer mask. A white layer mask means that everything is going to be visible. Now, if I hit Command-I, it turns our layer mask black. So the layer is still there. It's just not visible because it has a black layer mask. But if I click on my layer mask and I use my brush tool and I paint with white, everywhere I paint is going to have Looks like an awesome 80s album cover right now. Everywhere I'm going to paint is going to allow that layer to show up. So painting white allows it to show up. Painting black allows it to go away. And as you probably imagine, you can use your selections to do things that are a lot more impressive than just painting different colors on an image. Like if I wanted to, let's just fill that with black. If I wanted to make a really cool selection right over there and just hit Command-I, it would just change color in that selection. And just like regular layers, you can use your Move tool and you can move layer masks around and things like that as well. So keep that in mind. All these tools are going to apply to layers and layer masks. And at any point in time, you can make these visible or invisible. You can delete them and uh, basically change your entire image without ever affecting your background layer. And to finish up our episode, we're going to go through just some of the menu items up here at the top. Now, this is the same type of menu you would get in any other program on a computer. So things like new and the close and save, those are going to operate the same as just about any program. You have editing here. You can do a lot of, so we covered some of the basics, the fundamentals today in Photoshop. There are so many more features. 
most of the time you're not going to be using those features. You, most of the time, it's like having one of those giant graphing calculators, right? Like most of the time you're doing like 5 plus 30 equals 35. Well, hopefully you don't need a calculator for that one, but you get the idea. Most of the time you're not using like tangents and cubed roots and things like that, what all the other buttons are. But if you need them, they're there. Same kind of thing here in Photoshop. You've got all these things like perspective warp, which you'll use maybe five times in a year. If you need it, it's there, but we covered all the basics today. And that's for the most part, your, these tools here, working with these layers and layer masks will get you most of what you need done in Photoshop. But I do recommend going in and playing around with these. And we have episodes on using just about every tool and feature in Photoshop. You can go to image, you can, here are some more adjustments if you'd like to change some of the like hue saturation. These are going to apply it to the layer itself rather than creating a new layer. So be careful if you go to image mode and adjustments, these are a little bit more permanent because they don't apply to a new layer that you can turn on or off. Changing image size and things like that. Working with layers are so important, they've got their entire own menu structure right here. Type, working with selections as well, and then you've got some really nice filters. If you want to get in and kind of play around, when I was first getting into Photoshop, go to the filter gallery. It's a lot of fun. You can make your image look all kinds of weird. All right, 3D, I don't really use a whole lot, but it's also worth getting to know and uh, basically changing how your view is and then working with all of your different windows so you can kind of play around and say, you know what, I want a color window so I can just always have my colors up. All right, guys, well, that's a general introduction into Photoshop. And I know this was like quick and dirty, but for those of you guys who are just starting out, I hope this helps. Now, our next episode, we're gonna get into some of the key tools we're actually using in Photoshop and kind of get you a little bit more familiar with those. And the, by the end of these three quick start guides, we hope that you guys are gonna be a lot more familiar with Photoshop and kind of feel a little bit more confident to actually go in and start doing some things in Photoshop. If you guys are interested in getting more in depth and really learning all the unique tools that Photoshop has to offer, I would really recommend our Photoshop 101 and 201 bundle pro tutorial. You can get to it by clicking on the link on the screen right now and also in the description right down below. It's like six hours of learning Photoshop, total intense, but a lot of fun, just like our free episodes. Thanks so much, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like what we're doing here at Flurn, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Comment down below if you've got ideas and share this with your friends. Thanks again, and we'll flirt you later. Now, most of the keyboard short... Damn it! <laughs> so, I'm a poly... Eh. <laughs> I'm applying a Gaussian... So, when I'm using Photoshop, I'm using Gaussian blur...